Hello, everybody. Uh, I can see some of our regular friends. Hi, Luigi. Hi, Raja. Hello, Mamoon. Hello, Grant. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. This webinar is one of the new series launched by the AI Institute. The new series is named Saturday Night Live Coding, which is similar to the Saturday, Saturday Night Live show, but uh, this one is for coders. Uh, this one will be running regularly every week so that we can have a live coding hands-on experience for as many as uh, three hours weekly. And the approach we are going to use here is a project-based approach. We're not going to learn the syntax without uh, applying it into the context of a project. So with, for, for example, for today, we are applying a classification over the IMDB reviews. And next time we apply a similar project and during the project, we follow a backwards goal driven approach to learn the new syntax. So today we will be focused on uh, the new data set APIs in TensorFlow. In order for you to follow along, uh, I will share with you the exercise uh, collab notebook in the chatting. You should have received it. So to follow along efficiently during this webinar, uh, I would uh, recommend that you open the notepad on one of your screens and then follow the exercise on the other. If you don't have two screens, you can uh, follow us on that, um, on your tablet or in your phone and then do the coding on the computers. Uh, suit yourself to whatever setup makes you uh, learn efficiently. The goal is the, uh, to implement a project in a live coding format. And then during the learning, you not only observe the code, but you get a hands-on feeling of uh, the internals and how it works and how to build your own coding. Uh, hi, Mohammed Sharaf, how are you? Uh, are you joining from Germany or where are you located at the moment? I can we are having um, many attendees. It's a pleasure to have you all. So uh, Mohammed is joining also from Germany. So a uh, little bit about the AI Institute. The AI Institute is a digital transformation, a data science and big data bootcamp headquartered in Boston. And it has branches in uh, Paris, France, and in Nairobi, Kenya. And it's uh, applying its uh, training programs for 480 hours, three months of full-time, uh, uh, fully mon monitored by instructors coding exercises and uh, projects-based uh, learning. And then afterwards, uh, you become an expert in uh, almost uh, uh, all the generic and basic of data science and big data, and you can choose your specialty as per the project. You can follow us on the main website for more inform information about this one. For today, let's get started with the notebook. Please, if you are having any trouble viewing the notebook and the font or the typography, please let me know, I can increase the font. So here is today's plan. The plan is that we'll start exploring TensorFlow 2 dataset APIs, and we'll use that with the uh, IMDB reviews dataset. The dataset itself is a, a collection of positive and negative reviews. Uh, hi, Emi Dushi from Boston. Nice to have you. So uh, it's all very encouraging. All the attendees are very engaged. I'm glad to have you today all as my guests. So today's plan as on that screen uh, in, the not, uh, uh, in the notebook I have shared with you and I'm sharing on the screen as well. So we'll download the data set and then start doing the basic pre-processing. We will not go very fancy about the pre-processing because the pre-processing pipeline for natural language processing is kind of intensive and subject to a lot of work a kind of uh, a stop words removal, uh, named entity recognition. A lot of work goes into the pre-processing pipeline. We will focus on 
reprocessing the data set in a basic setup, kind of tokenizing the sentences and then indexing them and then applying embeddings. And by embeddings, I mean transformation or representation learning so that we can optimize the accuracy of our classifier. At the end of the day, our classifier will be able to tell whether a review is positive or negative. We will apply four different algorithms. Uh, all are under the family of recurrent neural networks. We will first, for baseline benchmarking, we'll use a densely connected neural uh, network, uh, a basic feed-forward network, and then we will start exploring three different types of recurrent neural networks. We will explore the LSTM, long short-term memory neural net, uh, recurrent neural network, and the gated, gated recur recurrent unit, and finally, the bidirectional LSTM. And the, just for clarification, the training of uh, such models on such uh, large data sets requires a kind of a dedicated GPU. So at the end of the uh, project today, I will give you a hint on how to improve the performance even further and how to, uh, to think about approaching the problem in real life situation and also to uh, uh, utilize and reuse pre-trained models for the same uh, project. Let's start. So I have here some global variables. The global variables are kind of set arbitrarily. I, I set them uh, using trial and error while I was training the model on a, a local GPU. Uh, I set the learning rate. The, the learning rate is uh, the value I'm using for my optimizer so that if it is very low, the training would be very slow. If it's very high, the training will be very unstable. So I need to find a sweet value where the training is stable. Usually you find this value using a great search or cross validation. And then for regularization for different layers, I'm defining a global variable lambda. This is kind of the regularization so that if the, va the values of the parameters of the model grow very large, then I can uh, kind of add a banality to the loss function so that the model weights uh, are uh, clipped or shrinked. And then I can avoid uh, sorts of overfitting over the training data, meaning allow the model to generalize well to testing data. I set a kind of a generic number for batch size. That's uh, the training for uh, most machine learning algorithms is done in many batch a stochastic gradient descent, and then you specify chunks of the data. I use here 32, kind of a magical number works in most cases, but the real limitation here is that because the GPU I'm using is a limited memory, so I need to, I could not go beyond 32 very far uh, because I'm still adding more complexity when I'm adding the recurrent neural networks. And the recurrent neural networks, they are very intensive in terms of computations and require also uh, a lot of memory. So it was kind of uh, difficult to have a large number in the batch size and a large number of uh, neurons in the recurrent neural networks at the same time. The more GPUs you have, the, the more uh, flexibility you have over these variables. Uh, for uh, illustration purposes, I'm training the models only for 10 epochs so that it's uh, uh, does not take a lot of time. And for for the live uh, session, uh, I can even decrease the, the number further so that uh, we can uh, utilize the time more efficiently in analyzing the code and so on. For the training steps, I'm using uh, 45 because I know uh, beforehand that the data set has uh, 25,000 samples for training and the same number for testing. So by using a batch size of 32, I can loop over 50% of the data using a 45 training steps. So by dividing 25,000 by 32 or over 32, then I can get around 90, 95. So I, I can, I'm, I'm satisfied in this illustrative example with uh, iterating over half of the training set and the same for the validation set. Then I specify the embedding size. The embedding size here is of great interest 
to a spe specialist in a natural language processing because we are kind of learning a lower dimensional feature vector from the text data that allows us to draw better decision boundaries between the data falling in different classes. The more embedding size we have, the, the kind of, uh, uh, we have more features into the latent space, but if we go very far in the embedding size, and then we have an embedding size, let's say, for example, very large compared to the original uh, vocabulary size, then we might lose some representation power, meaning it is also hyperparameter that need to be specified very carefully. Some research papers uh, have a generic uh, embedding size around 20. So in this example, again, 32 kind of work uh, uh, rather moderately. And finally, due to memory limitations, I'm setting the recurrent network hidden layer size to 16. So this was all the boilerplating uh, starting point. So I'm defining global variables so that I don't have uh, to uh, write that by hand every time uh, as we are training uh, four models in the next section. So I will start here by importing TensorFlow and TensorFlow datasets. So by importing TensorFlow, uh, I'm allowing myself to use all the libraries available in TensorFlow. And then by import importing TensorFlow datasets, kind of I'm using TFX. TFX stands for TensorFlow Extended or Extended TensorFlow, meaning that I can use some of the libraries uh, recently integrated into TensorFlow uh, as the secondary or supplementary libraries. One of them, which is becoming more like a mainstream, is TensorFlow datasets. Now, let the fun begin. Let's do the actual live coding. This was all kind of boilerplate start point, so we don't uh, spend too much time on defining variables later on. So here I need to get my data set. And to get my data set, I will need, first I'll need now to initialize my kernels. Make sure that you have the GPU enabled in the call app. You can decide that uh, by going to uh, the runtime and from the runtime, choosing to enable the uh, GPU. And just for demonstration, you can go runtime, change runtime type. It's already on GPU in my case. You click save and then uh, it will already have the GPU. So now the kernel is initialized and I'm signed some GPUs. Now let's get started with downloading the data set. So I use the method load and I can pass any other name of any other data set that I know it exists in the system. But I will be using now the IMDB reviews. And there are variations of IMDB reviews that are already ones that are pre-processed for you. But again, for sake of illustration, I will be using the one that's plain text so that I can explore with you together today how we can uh, pre-process the data set even the basic processing. And I'll give you some hint at the end on how to go beyond the basics. Remember, we'll be doing this kind of uh, Saturday night live coding every week, and it will be announced ahead of time on our website and on uh, social media pages. And then there are some other parameters that I can specify. For example, when I say with info, that would return an object, a kind of key value object, holding information about the training and the testing data, such as the number of classes, the number of examples, the different splits. And in cases, if I'm using another uh, pre-processed data set uh, beforehand, then the with info will return the encoder vector, that uh, encoder object that was used to encode the data in the first place. So I can use it again for encoding new samples and I can use the decoder attached with it for decoding the already encoded data available in the repository. So it's a very powerful to have. So I'm having it with info equals true. And then since we are going, going to do sentiment analysis or a, a classification over the text, whether it is a positive or a negative review, I will need to use a super, as supervised equals true. So now I'm using a supervised learning. I'm getting my data as 
X features and Y targets. Uh, the features in this case are the actual reviews and the targets are the classification zero or one, uh, negative or positive. And then since I don't have it on uh, cached on desk, I will say it's safe to download. Finally, I can say which is split I'm interested in. So it gives you more power, which you want a uh, split you want. Do you want the train split or the test split? As you can see, uh, we can, we divide our data into training and testing splits so that the training split is used for training the model while the testing split is used for uh, consistently uh, validating the results on data that the model has not seen during the training time. This way we can uh, trust the reliability of our model as it generalizes to new cases. So, and then I can specify the splits I'm interested in in the tuple. I'll say TFDS on dot split. So this is the object holding the different split types as enumerators. I have the train split, comma, TFDS dot split dot test. You can also use the autocomplete. I read it run. So uh, it's uh, all capitalized. Take a little uh, few moments to download into this new one time. Uh, while it is downloading, I, I can see Sonal Kilowattkar saying hello. Hello, Sonal. Hello, everybody. If you have questions during the session, please uh, feel free to share them in the chatting. Again, it's uh, taking a few minutes. So it's giving me an error that it can time. So it's uh, it got disconnected in between. Now it's connected. Reinitialize my variables. And here we go. It's working out as expected. Almost 50% done. So if uh, I have already shared the, the call app file uh, in the chat messaging, so I believe you are following along with the coding. So James is asking, yes, I have already shared the, the file. Let me share it again with you, James. Here you go. So uh, you can code along, and that's the point of live coding to code along. I I guess it is it is done. It's downloaded. We we'll have some insight into what's happening. So I can see here I've got the information, the versioning, the original homepage from Stanford uh, website, the labels. Uh, there are two classes only. And then you can see your number of classes equals two. 
and and then I can see twenty five thousand test images, twenty five thousand training images, uh, and if you are using unsupervised, it's going to be fifty thousand. And the uh, reference, if you want to uh, uh, cite this data set in your paper. Now that we have some information about the data, let's see how we can extract information from this data. So we can say info object dot splits, and I'm, I'm getting the keys uh, if, if I say info, because it's, uh, I can say type of info. That would give me the, the type of the object, which is a data set info object. Uh, and then I can reference, for example, the different attributes in that object, uh, in this case, the splits. And I can specify, because a split is a dictionary, whether I want to get the number of the train or the test split, and then I can say number of examples. Uh, sort of a clean way to uh, use later when I'm doing some uh, iteration over the data, so I can know uh, programmatically how many samples exist in my data set. So I will, I will start now to, uh, to do some uh, exploration of the data. The point of this step at step two is that I want to extract all the unique words in my data set, again, without any fancy processing like a stop words removal uh, and so on. So I will import from the math library built in Python the seal method uh, for rounding up. And then I'll define the total size uh, of my uh, data set, a uh, training set in this case. I've already extracted that as n for the splits of the train dot number of examples, just like I've done in the previous block. And then for simplicity, I will use batch size equal one. So I can process one sample at a time. Uh, in the next block, I'll show you how to increase the batch size. I just here illustrate the basic encoder uh, tokenizer functionality. And then how many iterations I loop over the data set. Since it is uh, batch size is one, it's uh, as many iterations as the total size. But to make it again uh, formalized uh, in a generic way, I can say I will iterate the ceiling rounding up of the total size divided by the batch size. And I can add a plus one for safety. Since we are using uh, unique words, it will not affect uh, my execution. And then I need now to use the tokenizer from TensorFlow datasets. This is available in the pre-processing libraries. So I'll say tfds.features. That will give me access to many uh, kind of pre-processing uh, methods available uh, out of the box. So, uh, as you can see here in the in the uh, autocomplete, it started building building things up. Uh, on top of the list, I can see audio. Uh, I'm interested in text. So I'll say text dot tokenizer, and then I'll create a unique set. That means I I'm interested only in the unique words in my in the unique words in my data set. So I, I can see here a question from uh, James. Hi, James. Yes, uh, we, I will share with you the complete file after uh, the live coding session so that you can uh, uh, reference it also. Any questions are welcome. And uh, it's good to have some interactivity in the session. And then I, I need now to loop over the data set line by line, uh, sample by sample, and then extract the words and save them in my vocabulary set. So I can say for four, and then I can say batch comma label because the data set is supervised. And then I've already defined my data set as DS train underscore train uh, object. And I can say, now I can use now this uh, uh, method from TensorFlow to because the object now is of type TensorFlow dataset, so I can safely use any of the methods available, such as batch, which will batch the dataset as the number I'm passing, which is batch size. So I will batch the batch size I just decided. 
as the argument so that will give me chunks of uh, one element one sample at a time and then since this is kind of a generator i think a synchronous generator i need to perform an action and say okay please take uh, as many number of takes as i need so that will i create and uh, give me samples uh, x comma y, uh, y or uh, text features and target labels then i can use the tokenizer the tokenizer here will break the the sentence the review into words and using the tokenize method i can now apply but well, i need here to perform a little bit manipulation because the object is a, bin a binary encoded or byte encoded because uh, to be more efficient they encode it as bytes and then save it uh, serialize it into the repository so i need to cast it to a string and then <clears throat> uh, since i'm looping over batches and i'm sure that the each batch has got only one uh, sample at a time it is safe for me, which I will make more generic in the next block, to say batch square brackets of zero, so that I'm getting the first element in my batch, of which is already uh, sliced into one element. And for tokenizer to work as per the documentation, then I need to convert it to NumPy object, so that the casting uh, is smooth, and then I can uh, apply the tokenizer to the uh, sample sentence. Having done this, the return now is an array. The array is containing the broken words. The... Yes, uh, Muhammad Sharaf. Uh, I will be doing that in, uh, just after the tokenizer. So I will sh be showing this in the next block uh, together, the original text and the tokenized text, so that you can compare them side by side. So I'll be just doing that after completing this line. So I'll be saying here vocabulary now i'll use the method update so that it adds the unique tokens only tokens is a list of broken down tokens so i run this one because it's running over all the train set it's going to take a short while but in the meantime uh, let's answer the question of uh, Sharaf. Uh, he's asking, what does the data set look like? And it's a completely valid question. And that's what actually I've done during the preparation of the project. So I will inspect the batch comma label in DS train dot uh, batch. I can, I can directly take one since I know I just need one. Or I can say dot batch of one. Let's do sm small batches to inspect. So, and then I can inspect the, the batch, and I can say inspect also the tokenization of the batch. I can say tokenize, and then a string of batch of zero dot number. And let's see what happens here. Uh, just a typo, tokenizer. Tokenizer is not defined, uh, tokenizer dot tokenize. So you have here, this is the, the first one. So th this was an absolutely terrible movie. Don't be lured in by Christophe for walking or Michael Ironside. So this is the actual uh, the actual review, which is apparently very negative. And then when we apply the tokenization, you can see here the data is already broken down to uh, words for us. And then it's uh, kind of magically escaping the punctuations, the commas, the stop, the periods, and so on. So th this is how the data uh, looked like before and after we tokenized. So we need to inspect our vocabulary size. Now I will inspect the unique words. 
And I know the data set has got 25,000 uh, samples, but when I broke it down to words and then I, I took only the unique words, I ended up with 94,000 words from the training set. Next, uh, I will be doing the same for the testing set. And here comes two arguments. Should I, should I add my testing set in the pre-processing or should I not? And then comes the argument that you already have the uh, out of pocket or missing values uh, tokenization and the encoding uh, handled for you in the TensorFlow data set and the other NLP libraries to handle out of pocket or uh, uh, out uh, uh, of the training data uh, vocabulary. For sake of simplicity, I will be adding the testing set here to the vocabulary, and then I will let the new data that comes later in the test in the production phase to be mapped as out of pocket values. So again, now we go faster with this one. I already know the size of my test set. I, I'll take it from the info object. And then I will set the batch size now to a larger value so I can demonstrate nested loop. And then I say, okay, now the number of takes will be again the ceiling of the total size, which I've just calculated, divided by the batch size. And again, I, I add just one more iteration for uh, safety. Now I will lab, uh, loop again over batch, comma label. And the testing set this time. Again, I specify the batch at the batch size. And then I will take how many times I should take. I'll take the number of ticks. This is kind of a division formula so that I can loop how many times exactly over my data. Uh, when I'm dividing it, slicing it at this number of batches. So now that I've got a batch and label and I still need to apply the tokenizer, I, I will loop now over the samples in this batch. I'll say how, how many times I need to loop. I know the batch size, so I can loop for I in the batch size or I can take the, the batch size from the shape of the batch already. Let's try taking from the shape to illustrate as many functionality as possible. So I already got the batch as a tensor and then I can take the shape and I take a first element of the shape, which is the number of samples in the batch. So, and then I can apply now the tokens equals tokenizer, but tokenize, and then again, I cast it down to a string. I, uh, I have got the sample i, and I can say numpy, and that's it. You might be wondering uh, whether we can apply the tokenizer, the tokenize directly on a batch. Uh, well, give it a try. Uh, it's never uh, for granted. I'm just trying to show as many different ways to do the same thing so that we can discover together and explore the, data, the TensorFlow APIs. And then I will update my set of unique vocabulary so that I can uh, augment the data I have got already from the previous step, which were 94,406. I should run this one, should take a little while. I say length of vocabulary, so I can inspect the size of my vocabulary, how much it increases after this step. So I can see I've added uh, more like uh, 31,000 more uh, samples. Actually, I have a few, um, few more. They are kind of a uh, little bit around 30 to 40,000. So now I, I need to use this vocabulary size for the embedding layer later. 
So I will save it so that I don't have to calculate it every time among the global variables I'm having. Now this is done. Let's review what we have, we have been doing. So far, we have downloaded the data set using the TFDS or te TensorFlow data sets. And then we got train and testing split and information object. We have inspected the information object, uh, printed some of the attributes available in the information object class, such as the number of examples. At this step, we started to loop over all of the samples in the training set and tokenize them, break the sentence into words. And then we uh, took a sample for uh, uh, exploration and see how it looks like. You can see it's a byte encoded. And then I uh, bookmark my vocabulary size, apply the same thing with a, a little bit uh, different syntax to uh, explore more ideas. And then I've got the vocabulary uh, increased uh, to 130,846 uh, 130, words, unique words. And then you, you can see here, I have uh, bookmarked the vocabulary size. Now, since the data set, as you have seen, is words, is strengths, I need to feed them to a neural network. And since I want to feed them to a neural network, I must convert them to uh, numeric features. There are many ways to do that. I can do a one-hot encoding, but you know that uh, doesn't always work well because I, that means I need the one-hot encoding of 130,000 uh, elements at least. So not kind of uh, uh, feasible or, or applicable. And especially in more advanced the natural language processing applications, it will not fly well with us. So the idea is to use embedding, word embeddings. Word embeddings is kind of the, it started with word to vec, then moved to Clov, uh, fast text, uh, Elmo, and then Bert, uh, XLNet, and uh, now we have uh, uh, Roberto. You know, it's uh, a very wild area of research. It started with uh, simple embeddings using neural networks and the context around them, but then developed with the development of transformers and self-attention, especially the paper attention is all you need in 2017 was kind of a major breakthrough in the world of natural language processing. So for sake of illustration in our uh, uh, hypothetical project, we will be converting the vocabulary to integer uh, indices. So for example, the word I becomes zero, uh, M becomes one. Uh, I am a, a programmer, programmer becomes uh, two. So every word in my vocabulary will be mapped to a unique yeah. integer index. And then, so uh, Ajne is asking the paper of 2017. Let me put it down in writing. It's uh, titled, Attention is all you need. And apparently you need to pay more attention. So it's a bun, attention is all you need, which is a, an awesome paper. And uh, for, uh, it's uh, available also explained by a professor at the University of Waterloo in Canada. You can search it on YouTube. It's very well explained and broken down in an intuitive manner. Uh, if you search attention is all you need and then type down the University of Waterloo it's kind of an awesome lecture. Uh, I enjoyed watching it around the 45 minutes. So now we have our vocabulary mapped to indices. I need to encode the, the words into in, uh, in, indices and I need to save my encoders for later uh, usage in production. And you know, TensorFlow 2 is really optimized for pro pro production pipelines and it offers many capabilities that allows you to freeze your graph and freeze your pre-processing all together at one shot and use it in production for pre-processing and prediction on the new data as it arrived all at once. So now I will use a different kind of uh, pre-processing from the TensorFlow dataset API. This new one will do both the tokenization and the indexing a one shot for me. 
So I can say TFDS dot features, and you can see that it's very rich APIs for images, audio, and you know whatever data set you're having, you will find it amazing. And then you can say token text encoder. This will actually convert words to numbers. So I can start working with them. And I say vocab list. This is why I needed to do the vocabulary in the first place. Usually you start in a bottom up approach. You start with your models and walk backwards what you need to do. So I pass the vocabulary here as my uh, vocabulary list. And then I'll say tokenizer. I can pass the tokenizer or leave the default. In case I've done some manipulation or I'm using a special custom tokenizer, I can uh, uh, use my own tokenizer or just provide the object I've just created before. So I'm, I'm trying to explore as many of the features together so that we can become more familiar with uh, these APIs. And by the way, if you're interested, the, the Google uh, has launched a certification pro program for TensorFlow uh, programmers. You can apply on the TensorFlow website and take the exam and then become a certified TensorFlow developer. Uh, it's a kind of a new thing and very interesting. Uh, and then now I have uh, uh, specified here another parameter, lowercase, and this lowercase allows me to encode, for example, uh, if I'm getting two words and these two words, they are the same, but one is capitalized and the other is not. So uh, I can map them to the same uh, integer index. So far, we have got an encoder. And again, if we have used the pre-processed version of the data set already pre-processed for us, the encoder would have been available for us beforehand so we can use encoder and decoder pairs for our pre-processing. Now let's do a small test. That's what I was uh, talking about in terms of exploration of what the original data looks like and what the new data looks like. So again, this one will become very familiar now for batch label in the training set. Let's take one sample. And then let's encode it. And then use the batch. And again, you, you can see here, it's a, a requiring a NumPy. Not very, uh, a, a, not very agnostic or uh, homogeneous with the new agar execution of TensorFlow. That's why I have a track I will share with you a few blocks from now. This track will show you how to combine graph execution with eager execution. That means we can uh, actually take the, the best of both worlds. So I can now print a, a batch and print the indexing of the batch to see what's happening. Again, it's kind of an interesting question to see if the same encoder requires sample by sample or can be applied a one shot on the batch. So you can see this has become the number 104,587, was become 109,126, and so on. Every word has been mapped to an integer. Now we can use this in the next uh, steps. But before we arrive at our model design, there are still some uh, more steps and pre-processing to be done. Again, if you have got uh, any questions, share them in the chatting or in the questions tab. So now this is the trick I'm talking about, available as a reference in the GitHub repository, discussion between the developers, contributors to the main TensorFlow branch. So the idea here is that now we want to implement this tokenizer and encoder as one step with our model uh, inference in production. And we also want the pre-processing to happen in a more homogeneous way with the, the training of our model 
in TensorFlow eager execution. But then, because in eager execution, if you break out from the TensorFlow uh, objects into NumPy, then you need to use a static graph. And because eager execution behind the scenes is using the graph again, but it's done for us automatically without us having to worry about the graph design. So when we've done .numpy, exactly here, when we do this kind of conversion for the encoder uh, homogeneity, then we are breaking our graphs. So the trick here is to use another struct from TensorFlow 2, which is the by function, allows you to connect your graphs by passing a wrapper function, tf.py function, this will kind of work as a glue, making ends meet when you are uh, doing some weird, exotic, or out of TensorFlow manipulation. And this is uh, rather interesting because I said we are doing here the basic pre-processing, but once you start worrying about stop words and uh, many other uh, limitization, uh, POS tagging, other NLP related stuff, you will need to go out of the TensorFlow world. And in order to do this, you can use a uh, Scikit uh, natural language processing toolkit, Spacey, Gensim. Yeah, there is an, another library called Hugging Face NLP. Allen NLP, you know, uh, it's uh, essentially the Olympic village out there with all these libraries. So this method, rubber function, will allow you to do this uh, out of the box. So, I will start here from the bottom and I walk my way up. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to map, apply the tokenizer and the encoder to all the data in my training set. How I can do that? I need to say BS train, which is the dataset object, dot map, and this will map all the objects in my data into uh, the pre-processing function. But again, because I am using numpy casting or conversion, I have broken the graph execution, uh, or, uh, which is done uh, for me behind the scene. So I need to glue it together. So I will use the method I just defined above, and then I will go through it to see what it does. So I will encode now the method. This one is taking care of the encoding, applying the encoder to every sample in my data set. The encoded words are the tokens. Uh, Ajni is asking whether the encoded words are the tokens. The encoded words here are the integers. So if you have the data set, what we have done so far? So far, we have taken the data set, which is reviews, text reviews, broken them to tokens using tokenizer, converted the tokens to integers using the encoder. So that's the flow, two steps, tokenize and encode. The result is integers and numeric values. If it's still confusing, yes, the tokens are encoded into integers, yes. If you're still confused about this, feel free to post any questions in the chatting. I'll be glad to answer all of them. And I need to apply the same logic to the testing. So the same logic applies here, encode, map, function. So now let's go to the map function and see what it does. So the map function itself is a wrapper. So it will invoke the tfpy function, which is the glue that will connect my new eager execution to the old graph execution behind the scenes for me out of the box. And then I will use the method that's causing the trouble, pre-process. And then what are the inputs to this method? I will say inputs equal the batch, which is already passed in when I've done the mapping. So the map will apply the method to every batch and label in the data set. And then what output I'm expecting to have the batches as tf dot 
integer 64, and I'm expected to have the labels again as tf integer 64. So what I'm expecting here is that I'm expecting to get a tensor which contains elements of integers. Each one is 64 uh, bits. And then here is such a, syntax, a syntactic sugar to make sure that it's friendly and compatible with the uh, eager execution by setting the shape and allowing it to be none to infer the shape from the batch size. And again, for the label and setting the shape the same way and returning it. So this is a syntactic sugar I recommended again on the uh, GitHub repository by the contributors to the uh, TensorFlow library. Finally, what I have invoked here is the reference to the method preprocess. So preprocess itself will take the batch and label, convert the batch to NumPy, encode the batch and return the label. In cases, you know, sometimes what you need to do is that the labels, for example, are not one hot encoded. So you can say tf dot one hot encode of the labels in case you are using more than two classes, more than binary classification. And this would be kind of a, a nice pre-processing. There are many other features in uh, TensorFlow a beta set API that are all uh, contributed towards making it easier in production, such as uh, feature columns, which we, we might talk about in the next Saturday night live coding. Let's run this. And again, uh, just like uh, uh, you are expecting, we are trying to ve be very uh, pragmatic about our approach and then uh, inspect every line of our code. And that's what I do in uh, real life. Uh, I do a lot of unit tests. I inspect and debug my code line by line, word by word, if necessary. So I will do now, I will take some samples and see what they look like. So again, the same uh, for loop that we all know and love by now for batch comma labels. And now uh, my data set now is named to DS, let's take from the training data set. I'll take three uh, batches. The default batch is where we'll see the, the, the cardinality. And let's print the batch the sheep. You will observe here that we are getting different uh, size. So let me elaborate on this. If I say the batch of 16 and then take three and then print the shape, how is it going to? Uh, so you can see here, we are starting already to get uh, these errors because the shapes of the batches are not unique. And this is what we are going to fix in the next step. We are going to use batted batches so that all the batches, they are kind of consistent with each other. So I will revert back. I will see it's, uh, if I uh, remove this one altogether so that it works again. And now I know I have a problem now with the consistency of my batch size because the con inconsistency is coming here because every sentence is not of equal length. Some reviews are longer than the other. So I need now to find a way to make up for this. Fortunately, TensorFlow data uh, set is coming to it will allow me to do that out of the box without any effort on my side. Before I fix that with bad batch, uh, let me add some sugar, uh, explore more of the APIs that will be useful in my later discussion. So I will say token uh, DS train data set. I want to shuffle the data so that I can have some stochastic randomness in the data because if I give it all to the model, which, uh, which is contagious uh, uh, pieces of uh, samples that are all labeled, uh, uniformly, my model will kind of be biased, especially if the many batches are very small. So I need to shuffle and I can use a buffer size for shuffling. Let's say 2048 
You can use more, you can use less, uh, depending on uh, your memory uh, capabilities or uh, uh, storage. So I can do the same for the testing set. Your shuffle. And then I, I, I uh, pass again the buffer size. I'll use the same uh, buffer size. So the buffer size are actually the kind of the pool to shuffle in. Like for example, I will I'll be a, a kind of uh, a having a pool uh, intermediate uh, stage where I am sampling the data into 2048 samples before I pick from them. So it's kind of uh, shuffle and repeat done together. Uh, but uh, since it's uh, you need to do the repeat explicitly, so now I will be doing the repeat. So. Why do I need to do the repeat so that my generator does not run out during the model training? Meaning that I need to, uh, uh, for example, if I have a, a number of epochs to be 10, and then I'm having uh, 50 steps, then I need the repeat to be 10 times uh, 50, which is 500. So I need to provide 500 iterations over my data. So if the number of iterations I'm trying to provide is beyond the, the data set size, I will run into an exception saying the data set has all been consumed because this is an iterator or a generator. Uh, then uh, if it expires, it uh, just stops. So you need to specify whether you want shuffle and repeat or just shuffle without repeat and so on. There is a method called shuffle underscore repeat, which does it all in one shot. Again, uh, breaking it down for sake of uh, illustration. And then repeat, after repeat, I say a box. Because I have already defined the a box in uh, my global variables times the train steps. So I need to specify the a box times the train steps so that this is the number of repeats I'm getting. I'll do that again for the test set. The repeat and then a box times, but this time the validation steps. Let's run our code. You know, all these are lazy execution, so uh, a box are not uh, defined. Uh, let's double check on what name we've given it at the very top because uh, maybe when the session expired uh, earlier, we did not really uh, scroll up and run this. So it was not run. Let's run it and uh, scroll back again, down, way down, until we arrive at the error and give it a shot. Uh, actually, you can run the block directly without having to click on run by using the combination shift enter on the keyboard. Again, all questions are welcome. I hope you are following along the code on your screens. So now that's the problem. Uh, remember that we had different size for every enter uh, review in the data set. We need to add some end of sentence word, a placeholder, some token that says, okay, let's add all our uh, reviews to be the same size. So to do that, it's very uh, intuitive and straightforward, implemented already for us. I'll just say for, uh, using the method bedded batch. So I will use my object. I will say bedded batch and then specify the batch size. Batch size I've defined above. That will give me bad batches. So I don't run into errors later when I'm training the model. I will say drop the remainder because this will give me uneven batches again. Because if I say, for example, I, when I divided my data over batch size, I've got 50, but then when I round up, the extra one is not complete batch. So let's say drop remainder to. I can live with it in this uh, toy example or hypothetical example. I need to handle it more properly in real life. And then the testing set, 
and then I will do the padded batch, batch size. Uh, kind of get to the shift early, and again drop remainder equals two. Again, I kind of get all capitalized here unintentionally, and then run it. Uh, batch underscore size, you know, it's kind of typo. And here we go. I hope you are following along. Uh, don't hesitate to share questions. So now we've got the training and the testing. Now let's move to some observations. Now let's see how this affects our work. So if I say now for batch labels in my, let's say the training set, and then I will take uh, three just for inspection. And let's print the batch dot chip. So you can see here uh, I'm getting the batch size which is 32. I, I have run this twice. That give me an error here. That error is uh, that my my batches are double batched, so they are kind of getting 32 by 32. Kind of error happens when you run your code twice. Uh, be aware of it because if you, you run it more times, it affects your uh, uh, results. The solution I will take is that I will say, I will scroll up. Uh, okay, uh, James has managed to bring his system up. Uh, congratulations, that's good news. So now you can follow more interactively. Let me share the file with you. So he here you go in the chatting. This is the version I'm working on. But please be aware, I will be fixing it. So follow up with the fix. I'll scroll up to the point when I started do the mapping. Uh, right here. And then slowly go through my data. So that I make sure that my data is not double batched anywhere in the in between. Here we are, now it looks normal. I have batches of 32 samples, but then observe here, lo and behold, every batch is all kind of badded with uh, zeros. You can actually, when you do the badded batch, you can specify the parameter, whether you want to bad with zeros or other values. But observe here uh, when you do, okay, there are two observations. The first observation, when we encoded our uh, tokens to integers, it was encoded between one and the vocabulary size. So zero was untouched. So batted batch can safely use zero as bedding of our reviews. The second observation here is that our batches now, which are each one of them is 32 samples. They are all of the same size, but different batches have different sizes, which is okay because the embedding layer in TensorFlow APIs, the new version, they are already designed to work with batches of uh, each, uh, this, the, uh, within the same batch, the length is uh, equal, but from batch to another, the, 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 the length can be different. So it is kind of bedding on the batch size. Why it is not bedding, global bedding over all the batches, this is kind of uh, important because in case when you have the data set, a very large data set that does not fit in memory, it could be a kind of time consuming to go all over the data set, especially in, in if you're doing some kind of production pre-processing and then determine the maximum length. And then if in some production cases you get a vocabulary, uh, let's say for example, an, a review that's longer than the longest review in your training and testing data, then it's going to again appear the problem. So the design is allowing for uh, 
discrepancy between different batches, but within the same batch, it is all going to be the same size. You don't believe me, so let's try it. I wouldn't believe it myself unless I try and apply a unit test. Again, this is a good virtue of uh, programmers to double check on every aspect of their work. I have seen uh, uh, developers writing more than 25 unit tests for a single function. So it's uh, always a good habit to build a unit tests for your system, whether it is just a toy or a real life situation. And then what I'm doing here is I'm using an assertion. So I'm looping over every text in the batch and then I'm checking the shape of the line against the second shape, which is this one. I'm trying to check here. Are you sure that all the sentences within the same batch are of equal size or is it just uh, some blah, blah going around? So it run for this. We can run it. Let's uh, undo the, the print. Run it for 30 more times or not fire any errors. So we are safe here. Uh, you're welcome, James. Uh, please follow along. The more you follow along, the more interactive it gets. Again, questions are very welcome. This is the point of live coding, to share questions and share ideas and suggestions. Next, we will get to the whale, the word embedding. A precaution here, because word embeddings, they are kind of uh, uh, demanding in terms of training time. What we are doing here is hypothetical for uh, illustration purposes. Uh, when you are going to do this in uh, production, you are using going to use uh, more powerful GPUs, and you can also uh, benefit from a pre-trained model. There are many pre-trained models uh, either in the TensorFlow uh, TensorFlow Hub uh, website, or you can uh, find one published by. Uh, another uh, provider such as Ellen NLB. Uh, the, there are many uh, providers of pre-trained models. So for the sake of uh, illustration in our example, we build a simple embeddings layer to see how it works and understand it and inspect its results. So let's say tf.keras so now I'll start moving to the Keras uh, high-level APIs, which is one of the benefits of using TensorFlow 2 because it's now all embedded within uh, that new TensorFlow as a, a high-level API. You know, they have been trying with different APIs before, like the estimator APIs, tf.contrib. Uh, you know, there have been some uh, uh, implementations in the core TensorFlow but then they ended up using Keras because uh, it's designed to be very simple and uh, very agnostic to the back end. So it's uh, one of the benefits we can uh, utilize here. And then I'll be using the embedding layer. Now, observe here the parameters. The first parameter, input dimension, and then the vocab size. And since the vocab size here, I need to add two. Uh, uh, all my vocabulary size because I'm uh, using a vocabulary I have already done the vocabulary at the beginning of this session I have got all the unique words and got the size so I need to say okay embedding layer you are going to work on data coming from vocabulary of let's say 130,000 words but observe you need to add one for unknown new words that might happen in production. And you need to add one more for the zero padding I have used so that I don't run into errors later. And then I'll say output dimension. How, may, how, how uh, long should be the feature vector resulting from this step? I'll say the input size I have designated earlier. This allows me to run many experiments consistently. Here, lo and behold, this parameter of a great interest. Now, you have observed 
at previous step when we done the printing, the difference between the different uh, reviews, for example, this one, 120 words, this one, 112, this one is 132. If you do actually some visualization of the maximum and the minimum lengths of the reviews in the IMDb reviews data set, what you will observe is that there are reviews that are thousands of words long. I, I, I think I've come across one that's around 10,000 words. Not sure who's got the guts to write a review of 10,000 words. Um, that must be a very uh, great fan of movies and so on. But that means to us as data scientists that we need to be aware that there is high sparsity in our representation. There are a lot of zeros in the batching of the data that might affect the accuracy and the convergence time of our model. So again, nothing to worry about. TensorFlow team has already figured it out and they've added a parameter, mask zero. You set it to true and your brain goes away. And here you go, as simple as uh, a parameter configuration. So now let's do a bit more unit testing, which I know and love very much. I'll say for batch, comma labels. Now this one is uh, written in stone in your brain. Let's say DS train. And then I will take let's say for every uh, time of, uh, just to make it run faster, I can take less, but let's see how, how long it takes anyways. And then what I need to do now is, is to pass the data into the model I've just created. So observe here the uh, experimentation. I'm not using it to, the, to use this as my final uh, model. I'm using it uh, uh, as an illustrative example of how this method works. Because you know, one of the good things about the APIs of Keras is that you can take one layer, pass it some values, and inspect the results. This is exactly what will happen here. So I will say the output is the model of batch. So let's do take one and see the output. Remember the model is not trained yet. This is kind of the normal uh, Gaussian initialization of the weights. So I would say uh, take one and let's print side by side the batch. You know that there are 32 do I can print the last one. That will print the original input. And then I'll say print. Know that every time now I do uh, iteration over my uh, final uh, generator or iterator, it's already applying the tokenizer and the encoder all out of the box for me without me having to worry more about this. And, and this works like magic in production, by the way. Of course, there are many other precautions to take in production, but this is again, a illustrative project. You can see here, uh, this is what I start with. You can see a lot of zeros, but you can see some integers. So this is the in, uh, encoding of my text into integers. And then I've got more zeros to bad my reviews to, the, uh, to be of, uh, 887 for this uh, one batch, bad batch. And then when I apply the embedding, what I end up with is kind of a feature vector. The features, you can see the values, they are more like uh, or less sparse. And later when you do this in, uh, <clears throat> in more arithmetic manipulations, you can see that uh, the data is becoming more projected into a subspace 
that allows you to run arithmetics. For example, you can say um, man, uh, you can say the word king is related to the word queen. In the same sense, the word man is related to the word woman. You can say the word Paris is related to France in the same way the word uh, Berlin is related to Germany. And then you can do arithmetics. You can say king minus man plus woman equals a queen. You know, all these kind of manipulations and they work like magic in image processing when you're using a generative adversarial networks. You can add these uh, arithmetics also on the representation, learn it, but over images in the domain of images and allows you, for example, to say face plus some uh, condition will give you a face with eyeglasses or a mustache or a beard and so on. So this is what embedding looks like. It looks like a feature vector. I would like now to make sure that all my data, they are embedded uh, to equal size uh, embeddings. And I would uh, check some of the consistency here, again, for the sake of unit testing. So the first thing I will assert that when I pass the data through my model, it does not get flipped in the way, because sometimes this happens. You do a mistake in your arguments, and what happens is that you start with a batch size, and then reshaping happens in between, and then the data you get in the output is not the same batch size as what you've started with. And the same with the number of words, and, and so on. So, and here we've got the tech a question. Is word to make the same with embedding? Uh, if Igor is asking about where to vec, and I can see Muhammad is uh, jumping to uh, an answer. Uh, are you there? So it's the typing disappeared. So, you know, we are, we are trying to learn representations. So where to vec, uh, you know, sentence embedding, and, you know, all these kind of NLP pre-processing uh, representation learning methods, they allow us to convert our words into meaningful feature space. So you can say uh, word to vec is kind of the first to come uh, around word embedding technique. But then that was uh, done in 2000, I believe 11 by Mekulov in the paper word embeddings. And then he had added another paper on hierarchical soft max and added a few more papers afterwards. And you know, it's a, uh, uh, amazing because word embeddings can be done in many, many techniques and ways. Each time an improvement is uh, increasing the accuracy score of these uh, natural language processing techniques. And natural language processing is a key to natural language understanding because if we can decipher how natural language is processed and understood, we can allow the machines to access the Wikipedia, for example, and learn everything about human knowledge and civilization, and then learn things on their own. The same thing with videos. If you can allow a model to watch videos on YouTube and learn by imitation, you can end up with uh, unprecedented results. So, so there, there are many uh, areas to discover in this uh, technique. So in short, is worth to vec the same with embedding. It is one of the techniques to do the embeddings. Here we are using a simple neural network embedding without taking uh, the number of bags. For example, if we are want to do the, uh, the context, we can say a uh, bag of words or continuous bag of words. We can say, uh, I would like to take uh, two words before and two words after and use them as key to my embedding and so on. So I need to, uh, to assert now the the batch, the, the words in my uh, batches, because now, uh, oh, you're welcome, Igor. So uh, any questions are very welcome. That's the whole point of uh, the live coding is to be interactive. So please share questions, share ideas, uh, answer questions. It's all very welcome. So now, Every word in our vocabulary is going to be encoded with a feature vector of size, embed size. 
So let's say, for example, this word, which is already originally was uh, Christopher, for example. Now we indexed it to an integer. The integer now will be converted to a list or an array, which has the size as m bit size, 16 or 32 in our case. So you can see here the sub list, it corresponds to the first word. So every word now has increased in dimensionality. So we need to verify this. How do we verify this? We assert that our inputs had the same number of words as our, our outputs. Batch the size, batch the shape of one, equals out the shape of one. Because the index one indicates the number of words in the input and in the output. You can always do a print. You can print these values just for uh, clarification. Then we can, we want to ensure that all our words are encoded consistently. So I will say assert that output of shape two, which is the third dimension, is equal to my embed size. And then to uh, assert the last thing is uh, that I'm having the batch size untouched because sometimes when you are coding, you kind of uh, uh, don't inspect too much, don't analyze too much, and then you end up that the output batch size is not the same as the input batch size. Kind of a, a nasty thing to happen, and you spend uh, hours, if not the uh, nights and days, trying to figure it out, banging your head around the wall, and you know it's uh, it takes a lot of uh, sweat and blood to figure things out like this. Well, you know, better safe than sorry. So I will double check that my batch size is consistent. I will run this. So I will take, uh, I will not run for very long epochs because I would like to share as much ideas during this session. I'll run for 16 epochs. You can always run the same code and print because if you are following along, that would be very beneficial. You can see here, we ended up with the, uh, all our assertions did not fire any errors, meaning that we are doing things uh, right. We have not trained the, the model. We have just used it as is with random initialization. And what we ended up with, let's do just uh, one, Brent to make sure that we are visualizing the happenings in here. So I will print output chip on one line. I will print batch the chip on the other. You know, you can use tensor board for debugging and visualization. You know, and TensorFlow is becoming very rich. It's becoming kind of this de facto standard for deep learning. Of course, I'm a fan of PyTorch as well. PyTorch uh, done by Facebook. And I have done uh, some work with PyTorch. It's amazing. It's very easy as well. Uh, you know, it's kind of uh, interesting uh, because uh, a few years ago when things started, we used to say, use PyTorch for prototyping and use TensorFlow for production. But then I can see a, a PyTorch team are, are trying to make it more compatible for production as well. So it's it's good, this kind of uh, collaboration is uh, very uh, enriching to the community. What we see here is that we've got all the same batch size. And then the number of words in this example is 1190. Again, the number of words in the output is 1190. But instead of one integer per word, we are using 32 integers per word. Again, for the second ebook, uh, second uh, batch, 793 words, 793 words, but now we have a new dimension, 32, which is the embedding size. So every word now is presented by a vector. And you know, you can try some arithmetics on these uh, presentations, see if they make sense. Uh, kind of a common trick in natural language processing classes. 
Ajne is asking, can you show the whole code block? Yes, very sure. Uh, right, let me remove the padding. Here we go. It's visible now. Can, can you see it now, Ajne? Feel, feel free to do. Okay, we are most welcome. All questions are very welcome. And then having done this, you can, uh, uh, let me know if I'm, uh, I can move now to the next block. So let's recap uh, quickly. Uh, while well, everybody is uh, having some time uh, looking at this code block, what we have done so far, we have downloaded the dataset using TensorFlow dataset uh, extension. And then we have converted the sentences to, uh, we have first counted the unique vocabulary size of our dataset. We have got our unique vocabulary so that we can use that for encoders. And then we have tokenized the dataset, broken the sentences into words. We have converted the words into integers, and then we have converted the integers into embeddings, numerical representations. This is kind of a very basic pre-processing pipeline for uh, NLP. Thank you, Ajne. Uh, I can now move down. Let's uh, scroll. So now I'll build a simple model. This model will be more like an exploratory model Again, for sake of exploration, it will not do much, but we'll give a, a baseline that we can uh, move uh, from in the next blocks. So we'll use the TensorFlow sequential APIs now. You know you can use the uh, dynamic APIs or functional APIs, and you can use the sequential uh, APIs, meaning you're stacking on layers, one uh, over the other. Then you specify the, the layer parameters and an array. I will just specify the, the layers. I'll use the tf.curves uh, the layers and then I'll specify the same uh, parameters I've done earlier. So now I'm confident to move on because I've done a lot of unit testing before. I can make sure that my code is not going to break somewhere. Actually, what happened is the opposite because I started from the bottom where, where I want to end up. I want to end up with a classifier. So I built the classifier first. And then as I move uh, through the code, I debug the kind of errors I'm getting and then uh, improve on them to arrive at a formula where my code is stable. And to specify the input dimension, the output dimension, I specify here uh, mask zero. As to, as I have to avoid overfitting, so I can say embeddings regularizer, but be careful because like too much regularization can result in underfitting. So it's again I have parameters that need to be done uh, carefully, not arbitrarily. Maybe we can do one live coding session on a batch beam or uh, Optuna. All are kind of. Uh, hyperparameters optimization tools. We can also do a, a live coding project on how to use the Apache Spark for speeding up the training. Uh, you know, all these ideas and projects, uh, feel free to send the ideas and suggestions uh, to our page, the AI Institute page, so that we can uh, uh, prioritize the projects and the ideas and start working on them based on your feedback. What topics you want to have more than others? And then we can uh, start uh, making the material for them. So I will use a regularization to avoid overfitting for my data. And then uh, I'll use an L2 norm. I can use L1 or I can use a elastic net combination of L1 and L2. Again, I can use a grid search to find out which one to use. And then I use the regularization lambda, which I've done earlier. Having done this, now I've got my 
first layer in place. Remember why we are using the mask zero equal two, because if we don't, uh, you spend some time trying to figure out why your model is not converging at all. And then what happens? Uh, I add now, uh, I can use a flat, because the output of embedding is uh, two dimensional or more dimensions, not single dimension. So I need to use a flatten layer, or uh, in this case, I will use a global average pooling to take the average of the different uh, uh, outcomes of the layer. So I'll use the layer tf.care.layers.global average pooling, and then 1D so that it's all flattened down to one dimension. And then I can use now uh, a layer. I can use directly the classifier layer as tf.keras.layers, my output layer, which is a dense layer of, uh, since I have one class and I'm using I can say use one class of units equal one. I use activation equals uh, sigmoid because this is binary classification. This would work fine. I can make it interesting by adding uh, another layer just to see if, uh, you know, it's uh, okay to do. I can add the dense layer and specify the number of units. I'll use smaller numbers just uh, for uh, make this uh, code run quickly. Uh, I'll use the uh, 16. Kind of very small number. I don't expect much accuracy coming from there. But again, this is a baseline demonstration. What can be done? I can use activation uh, rectified linear unit. Uh, you, you can use leaky relu. You can uh, play around with that. You know, model design is uh, not trivial. It requires a lot of uh, experimentations and uh, search in the great parameters space. Again, I can use a regularization. I can say, uh, okay, activity regularizer or kernel regularizer. So I can regularize the output from my, uh, I can regularize the values, uh, the weights of my layer so that they don't grow very large, causing overfitting. And again, I can use regularizers. L2, and again, I will use the same one, the same value for simplicity. This is now my model design. I need to compile the model. After compiling the model, I say, uh, I need to compile the model, meaning I need to attach the model to an optimizer that will be updating the weights of the model. So I need to compile me uh, using an optimizer. Optimizer. I can use Adam optimizer. And let me start with the baseline using a stochastic gradient descent. And then I can specify the learning rate. Remember, you can use a string, pass a string, and then that will use the default learning rate 0.001. You know, kind of uh, uh, easy thing to do and to get start but later you, you need to uh, optimize the learning rate itself so optimizer tf .cad, optimizer .cad gradient descent learning rate equals learning rate then I can specify the loss now, since I'm not doing any customization on the loss I would say just binary cross and proby because I'm doing binary classification and then which metrics I'm interested in following I can specify the area under the curve of the precession recall. I can specify the ROC area under the curve. I can specify uh, many metrics, uh, maybe hinge loss uh, from uh, SVM. And, you know, many, many metrics are available by default for you. And you can define your own custom metric, by the way. In this example, I will be following the accuracy since it is uh, a classification problem. I can specify the F1 score. I can use uh, any other metric you are interested in, you can specify. 
Now this will compile my model by attaching it to the optimizer. The optimizer is uh, the algorithm responsible for the learning. The learning itself is happening with the back propagation and back propagation is calculating the gradients. Once I have the gradients and using the learning rate, I can calculate the new weights, which is uh, done with uh, over the many batches. That's why we are using stochastic gradient descent, uh, meaning I'm not uh, calculating the new weights based of the gradients of all the data set. I'm taking many batches, and this gives it the sense of randomness. And since it is random, it's stochastic. The actual reason why this is done is because the uh, gradient descent itself, when it's done in batch mode over the old data set, is intractable computational complexity wise. So to solve the intractability, you need to apply some slicing uh, over the data. So next, I need to train the model. So to train the model, I will say model dot fit. Now it, I need to pass the training data. So I'll say fin, uh, the, the final generator I've created the training. But also, I, I can pass the validation data. You can also pass a fraction uh, value, double value to the FET model so that it can actually split the training data into train validation split. For this example, I'll be using the testing set as a validation data. Uh, regularly, I will divide the validation data from the training data and preserve the testing set for the final uh, judgment or benchmarking of my model. And then epochs, I'll specify at the number of epochs. Uh, since I know this is going to take a while, I'll just make a few fewer epochs. But then it is safe now to specify the steps per epoch. Uh, again, let me use the smaller numbers than the ones above. But I, I feel free to uh, optimize larger numbers uh, and see how far you can get. I'll use 10, which is very small uh, compared to 90 to, com to go over the old data set, like kind of training on only 10% before updating the weights. And that's even going to take some while on collab. And then validation steps, I will specify as, uh, again, let's use uh, eight. There are arbitrary values. You need to be very, very careful with this in uh, real life. And then I will say verbus equals one. I'm going from there. I will now uh, start to tracking the progress of my model in training. Because I can, you can see here, observe already, that I'm returning the return of model.fit as history. History now will be a dictionary holding all the values that are available in uh, performance tracking, the loss function, uh, uh, the loss value, the accuracy. And if I add more, I get more. So history will include all of this. You can pass callbacks to the fit model uh, method to uh, actually redirect all these tracking performance values to TensorBoard. You can uh, uh, use callbacks for uh, early stopping, uh, for uh, learning rate decay. Many callbacks exist that make it very interesting to do this kind of uh, manipulation. One of the very interesting methods that you can find here is partial fit. So you can actually do your own for loop over the training data using the for loop that you have come to know very well by now for batch labels intake. And then inside the for loop, you do model dot partial fit. And that will instruct the TensorFlow API to train the model incrementally on your data. This could be utilized efficiently in production because you can set up a real-time data processing stream, and as data is coming into your system, you can re-update your model in an online learning fashion so that it takes benefit of the new data as it arrives. Many ideas exist 
many use cases, uh, trying to give analogies and examples, you will feel free to share your own uh, experiences with this kind of uh, APIs. So this will do a fitting. Now we need to extract the, the values uh, uh, for benchmarking at the end of this exercise. How we do that, I'll say less because I need to, uh, to break the values that are returned. And uh, the values that will be returned from model.evaluate. The return here uh, is the final, uh, I want to evaluate on the testing set. And how many steps I would like to do is the validation steps. I will not go for 45, I'll go for shorter values, kind of, uh, uh, we said uh, eight. So model.evaluate will return uh, a, a data structure. Uh, I'm not very sure kind of uh, the, the top of my head, whether it was a dictionary or a tuple, but by casting it to a list, I'm, I can break it down in the return into two variables, test loss and test accuracy because I'm quite sure that I'm tracking only two values. If I have more, I uh, do a for loop over the return keys and expect them. So now I evaluate my data, uh, I, my, my, my trained model, the final model on the uh, testing set for eight steps per epoch. And this will run for one epoch. One of the things that you need to be aware of here is that you need to use a checkpoint in a callback here to save the best model. Because this model, the one we are using after how many epochs? Two epochs. It could, it could be the one of the suboptimal models we obtained through the training. It could be a model that has diverged from the minimum, uh, global minimum. So you need to be sure that you are using the best model that performed well on your validation data. So make sure that you're using the right callbacks. Then you save the model and uh, load the model from that callback and use it for benchmarking. For simplicity, we save this track for the next live coding session. Model to evaluate the testing data and the steps equal eight. I have a test loss and test accuracy. Now I need to put them in a dictionary. I create a new dictionary and I will keep that as my DNN. And the value will be what has been returned from my test loss, comma, uh, test accuracy. If you're planning on plotting them as bar plot, you can use whatever reporting method you uh, feel are more comfortable with as per your plotting uh, requirements. And then I click shift enter. I have got here uh, invalid syntax, a comma most likely, uh, a comma exactly. And then shift enter. starts training one epoch, and then I'm getting this warning about uh, sparse indexing slices uh, to a dense tensor of unknown shape. So it's, uh, I hope this warning can uh, can be solved in future release of TensorFlow because it's causing actually the model to use, consume large amount of memory. But now we have used a very small number of epochs and steps. We can use started with 0.72 loss and 0.53 accuracy. And then uh, it kind of decayed because this is what's happening. It's trying in the gradient descent. And then our validation accuracy was 54%, but then it actually went up. So you, you can always uh, do better by doing more. So now we need to move to the next step. The next step will be working on the LSTM, the bidirectional LSTM and the uh, gated recurrent unit. Uh, uh, Amy is asking about the code. Uh, sure, my pleasure. Let's scroll back uh, right here. And uh, I am sure if you are following on the same collab uh, link I have shared the updates will be uh, automatically shared with you uh, during the, uh, as I'm writing them in the live link. 
I'm not sure if this is the case on your side. Uh, so this, this webinar uh, is set to terminate automatically after uh, 120 minutes, two hours. So uh, it will terminate automatically in, in uh, around 14 minutes. Uh, let's use these 14 minutes. Okay, thank you, Emmy. my pleasure. Uh, to see if you've got uh, more questions. And in the next week, we continue working on the rest of the project, try to draw more insights and see how to apply the, uh, recur the recurrent neural networks and how to use them. At the end of this uh, training, what you are expecting to see is uh, to get a rough idea about the different performance uh, uh, specifications of these different kinds of layers. And we have already done the TensorFlow 2 kind of heavy lifting. So the heavy lifting was in preparing the data set. So to recap, we loaded the data set. We uh, calculated the unique vocabulary words and their size. We broke the words into tokens. We converted the tokens into integers. And then we passed the integers as batted batches with uh, uh, random shuffling and repeat uh, operators and using the mapping to make this all happen. We also used the pi function wrapper to glue the, the gap between the eager execution and the graph execution. Finally, we used the word embeddings, a simple neural network based embedding layer uh, to uh, represent the data, the text data, into more useful numerical representations instead of uh, single integers. Then we built a basic embedding layer followed by a binary classifier layer, compiled it, fed it, and trained it, and then evaluated it on the results. Maybe what we could do uh, in the remaining 10 minutes, just for quick. Uh, Recap is to inspect the report dictionary. What we should get here is uh, DNN and then test loss and test accuracy. You can see it's 72% and 50%. One thing to, to remark here is that these values are very misleading because remember the number of steps is very small. The batch size is very small. And then any judgment based on these numbers alone without considering the overall data set will be very misleaded. Uh, embedding requires a lot of time for training. Uh, recommended to use a pre-trained embedding, maybe BERT or ELMO. There are others, uh, GLOVE, for example, fast text. Gensim also at the library called Gensim. It has a lot of pre-trained embeddings and uh, they can be used out of the box and integrated with the new. You can see because now we have by function to glue any graphs we are working on, we can use any kind of library that uh, can integrate smoothly into the execution of TensorFlow. And the next uh, week, when we uh, continue with our live uh, coding sessions, I will uh, go through the LSTM and the uh, gated recurrent URL and the bidirectional STM. Yes, sure, Ajne. Here, Ajne is asking why you are using vocabulary size plus two in the input dimension to our embedding right here. First of all, your vocabulary size is all the number of the unique words you have in your uh, training and testing set combined together. Then we added one more uh, placeholder when we did the padding, because remember the, the reviews were not all of the same size. We had short reviews and longer reviews. So we need to pad the reviews to be all of equal size. That means we added one more word to our dictionary that is zero. I remember our indexer preserved the, uh, the integer zero 
out of its uh, mapping. So it mapped all the words between one and the size of the vocabulary. So we can safely use zero for padding. And then we need to use one more word for unknown words. Because if you say a word is unknown in test time, then we need to, bet the, to, bet, uh, to add another integer index for unknown words so that they don't get confused with the words our model has been trained on. And that's why we use vocabulary size plus two. There are many other uh, things that we can do. You can use t uh, TensorFlow feature columns and very interesting feature columns can be added as one layer in here uh, in, in place uh, of the first layer of your model and then exported all together as a one unit into production. Many things that we shall discover together in, in the coming sessions on a project-based approach so that we can learn in a meaningful way. And as, as we progress week over week, you can build your own uh, libraries uh, of uh, functional code that you can put together quickly for new projects and that you can also use uh, for your own experimentation. I have shared with you the link. I'm sure that the link on your end is also updating as I'm updating here. And the next uh, week we continue and uh, let's preserve the remaining eight minutes for questions. So Ajne, have I, uh, are you comfortable now with this answer or are you still confused? Okay, uh, you are most welcome and my pleasure. Uh, we can take more questions. We've got seven more minutes before automatic termination of the session. So Neha is asking, will we get a recording of this video later? Yes, the recording will be sent to you in email. Uh, I'm uh, sad that you have missed the first part of the lecture. Uh, the recording will be sent to you in your inbox on the same email address that you have used for registering to this live coding session. And uh, can I, Amy is asking, can I publish my code on GitHub with a mention of AI Institute? That would be very nice of you. Yes, of course you can. Uh, we are doing the live coding as a contribution to the community to thrive the development and the uh, uh, training of new tools and libraries in the AI field, especially deep learning and big data. So you, can, you are very uh, encouraged to share the code and it is very nice of you that you want to keep the copyright of the AI Institute. That will be in order, very much uh, welcomed. Thank you, Emmy, and thank you, Neha. Uh, so also the recording will be uh, published on YouTube uh, later if you, uh, if you kind of miss the, the direct link in the inbox of your uh, email that you've used to register for the live session then you can also find it on our uh, YouTube channel. It will be published on our social media. Uh, if you don't get it for any reason, uh, feel free to reach out directly and I will be glad to share with you the direct link once the video editing is done. We have got five more minutes. So we can take more questions. Uh, he, hey, Tolo, how are you? Uh, Tolo is a regular uh, member of uh, the AI Institute uh, Coding Boat Camp, and he is uh, a professor of uh, physics. So uh, one of the very uh, intellectually educated uh, members of our uh, boot camp. Thank you, Tolo. I hope you enjoyed the session. Was it uh, good enough? I hope it was. Uh, Neha is asking, 
Will there be a lecture on PyTorch? Well, if you want to, uh, I would love to do a couple of projects on PyTorch and uh, one maybe for uh, computer vision, another one for uh, uh, natural language processing. We can do GANs, we, we can do whatever we want to do. Uh, it's uh, Saturday night live coding. Uh, so it's uh, going to be fun and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do and they become uh, regular followers on this uh, AI Institute uh, channel. Uh, Tolo is writing, it's very interesting, thank you. Thank you, Tolo, it's my pleasure. So for more minutes, more questions are welcome. And if you're still having trouble accessing the notebook, please let me know so that I can share the link again. Is everybody uh, able to access the notebook uh, efficiently with the updates on their end? Neha uh, is a uh, thing that's great. Okay, Neha, thank you. It's our pleasure. Three more minutes. Maybe we can take one more question. Was it clear enough? Any uh, confusing points so far? Okay, uh, since there are no more questions and you have got the coding uh, notebook on your end, uh, please uh, go through the documentation, find out more about the functions we have discussed today. And next time we try to do uh, one more project uh, and continue this project, of course. And it was a pleasure to host this session today. And the questions were interesting and the audience were very interactive. Thank you very much. I hope that you have enjoyed as much as I did and see you next week. Have a good night, everybody, and have a great weekend. Goodbye. Goodbye, Raja. Thank you for attending to the end. I'm really pleased you did. And thank you, Mamoon, for attending. It's my pleasure. Oh, thank you, Ajni. Uh, thank you, Grant. My pleasure. Have a great weekend. And thank you, Igor. Have a great weekend. Okay, it will terminate now, self-terminate. Bye-bye, goodbye.